She's like a sickness in my brain A vision standing by the window pane She ripples through the blinds And leaves me in a daze It's in the way her body moves me The way she grabs me and intoxicates Until the signals in my mind Forget to operate I take my pleasure from my alcohol She never give you any time at all She just comes in and goes, you know And I, she's got me living in a chemical love And I Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel So today's a coffee and crime time And we're talking about the Kelsey Barrett case And uh, Patrick Frazee, her fiancé Who is currently on trial for her murder now, originally, I didn't cover this case when it was happening. It was too close, too much like on the tail of Chris Watts and too similar of a story. Same state, same kind of situation. They met online, you know, they had a baby together. It was just too close to home at that point. And I was still recovering from the whole Chris Watts, Shanann Watts. Bella and CC, obviously very traumatic for a lot of us, and I don't, I don't really like to talk about it. So I never really covered this case while it was happening. But now that Patrick Frazee is on trial, I did want to do a quick overview of the case and talk about what has come out in the process of the trial. Before we get started, I do want to have a quick word from our sponsor, the lovely, the one and only Magellan TV. Magellan TV has been a loyal and amazing sponsor to this channel, and I'm so grateful for them. And not only that, I'm grateful for their service. It's obviously coming up on December now, and it's my goal to have all my Christmas shopping done before December 1st, but there's always those people that you don't know what to get for them for Christmas because, you know, they're just hard to shop for, or they have everything that they want, or if they don't have what they want, they go out and get it themselves. My father is one of those people. My own husband is one of those people. So what I decided to do this year was get a, an annual subscription to Magellan TV for my father for Christmas. Hopefully he doesn't watch this video. He probably won't. I'm not sure that he really knows how to use YouTube. Hopefully he doesn't see this. If anybody talks to him, shh. Anyways, I'm getting him an annual subscription to Magellan TV because like me, he loves documentaries and he loves history and he loves learning. So I think he's really, really going to like it. I remember when um, The Men Who Built America came out. It was like a docu-series. I loved it so much. I bought it for him on DVD a couple Christmases ago and I think it was one of his favorite Christmas gifts. So I think he's going to love Magellan TV. I'll have to set it up for him on his Roku, but but that's what's great. He has a Roku at home and he also has a new smartphone that he got last year so I can kind of show him how he can watch Magellan TV on both his device and his TV at home. Christmas is coming up guys and if you have that person in your life that's hard to shop for but you know that they love things like documentaries or history or science or true crime, it's the perfect gift for them. 60 bucks I think it is for the year, one and done and you've got yourself a really perfect Christmas gift. I do want to recommend a documentary on Magellan TV for those of you who have already signed up for your free trial or those of you who are planning on it. It's amazing, you guys. I think you're really going to enjoy it, and it's called Tortured to Death, Murdering the Nanny. And it's, I'm sure you've heard of the case before. It's a pretty popular case, but it's about this couple who tortured their French nanny, Sophie, to death and then burned her. It's such an intense story, and the documentary goes really in-depth and really in detail. So check that out if you have Magellan TV or you're thinking about getting it. Magellan TV has over 2,000 documentaries. They're adding more every single week. Many of them are available in 4K for no additional charge. There's no commercials. It's great. I've been loving it. So I've talked about Magellan TV long enough. If you guys are interested in trying your first month free, click the link in the description box. After that, you can cancel if you want. You're not tied into anything. But once you try it, I really don't think you're going to want to cancel, especially because it's so worth it for the price that you pay. All right, let's get started on the case. Now, it is a tough case. It was something that was highly requested of me when this first went down last November. And as I said, it was just, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. Um, at that point, but I think it's a good time now that uh, Patrick Frazee is on trial. 
to talk about the case and go over it and then talk about what we found out during the trial. So Kelsey Barrett was originally from Moses Lake, Washington. She was described as being really quiet, really sweet, a devout Christian, and she always wanted to be a pilot. And she did actually end up getting her pilot's license and becoming a flight instructor later in life, but she met this man online, a man named Patrick Frazy, and she moved to Colorado to be closer to him. Now, Patrick Frazy lives on a 35-acre ranch with his mom, and his mom owned the ranch, and he managed it. So when Kelsey moved to Colorado, she actually purchased a townhome, and they lived separately, which I did think was strange initially, because if you're going to move to Colorado to be with somebody, you're probably going to want to live together, but allegedly there was reasons of why they couldn't live together at first, and they were trying to find a house so that they could live together. At first I thought it was because of her religion, maybe she didn't want to participate in premarital sex, but the couple did have a baby, a one-year-old daughter. And for the most part, everybody who knew the couple said that they seemed to be very much in love. Even Kelsey's mother, who claimed, yeah, they had issues like any normal couple would, financial issues and just, you know, plans that didn't always work out, but they made it work, and in the end, she believed that they truly cared about each other and loved each other. So just under a year ago, Kelsey Barrett disappeared, and here's kind of the timeline of what happened in her day before she went missing. So it's November 21st, it's late in the evening on November 21st, going into the early morning hours of November 22nd, which is Thanksgiving Day, and Patrick Frazee calls his fiance Kelsey Barrett and asks if she would like to just take a drive around the ranch with him and check on the cattle, and she says that she would. So they do this, but on the way home, Patrick Frazee says he's feeling sick. He's feeling nauseous. He just doesn't feel good. So Kelsey drops him off at his residence, the ranch. Then she actually drives to the store, gets him medicine, drives back to the ranch to drop the medicine off to him, and then she drives to her townhouse, and she gets home about 4 a.m., at around 9 a.m., Kelsey talks to her mother on the phone, and her mother said she was completely normal. She just sounded a little tired. You know, she's got a one-year-old baby, so of course she's probably a little tired. And Kelsey tells her mother on the phone that they're planning a Thanksgiving dinner. So she's planning on making this big Thanksgiving dinner for her and Patrick and their daughter. And then she says she has to get off the phone because the baby's diaper needs to be changed. Now, Kelsey's mother calls her back about 15 minutes later, and this next call is pretty short. They talked about the upcoming Christmas season, they talked about normal stuff, they had a normal conversation, and then they hang up. And this is the last time that Kelsey's mother will ever speak to her. Now around 12.02 that afternoon, Kelsey's spotted on surveillance camera with her daughter, and they're going into the local Safeway. She goes in and she buys, you know, stuff for Thanksgiving dinner, she buys sweet potatoes to make Patrick Frazy, her fiance, his favorite sweet potato pie, and she actually buys poinsettias, so she's planning for Christmas. Christmas and, and then she leaves the store. She's only there for about 25 minutes. So she leaves the Safeway at about 1224. She walks to her truck and at 1231, Patrick Frazee calls Kelsey, but there's no answer. But she calls him back two minutes later and both of their phones, Patrick's and Kelsey's, ping at the cell phone tower near Kelsey's townhome. Three minutes later at 1236, surveillance picks up a Toyota truck, a pickup truck that belongs to Patrick Frazee, headed toward Kelsey Barrett's home. Surveillance also picks up Kelsey Barrett's truck westbound on Highway 24, heading to her townhouse. And at 1244, surveillance again picks up Patrick Frazee's truck, this time going southbound on North Fairview, allegedly leaving Kelsey Barrett's home after picking up their daughter. Two minutes later, Patrick's at the local ENT bank branch, and he asks for a timeline of transactions for the date of 11-22. 2018, which was that actual day. And he also makes three deposits and one withdrawal. But then he asks the bank manager something weird. He asks the bank manager, can my baby be seen on this ATM footage? So he wanted to know if his one-year-old daughter was visible on the ATM camera. And the bank manager said, yeah, she is. But that was a weird question to ask. It definitely seemed odd at the time. And now knowing what we know, it seems more odd. So then at 1.24 that same afternoon on a neighbor's surveillance camera, the camera picks up a man resembling Patrick Frazee entering Kelsey Barrett's townhouse. 
And about two hours later at 325, once again surveillance picks up Patrick Frazee's truck going southbound on North Fairview, allegedly again leaving Kelsey Barrett's home. And right about this time, Patrick Frazee makes two phone calls, one to his mother and one to another young woman that we will talk about in a moment. Now it's worth mentioning between 1 p.m. and 4.30 p.m., both Patrick Frazee's phone and Kelsey Barrett's phone were connected to the cell phone tower that services Kelsey Barrett's townhouse. But after this, both phones began moving in the direction of Patrick Frazee's ranch. And that evening, both phones once again connected to a cell phone tower by Cripple Creek. And it is also worth mentioning that both Kelsey's phone and Patrick's phone stayed together between the days of November 22nd and November 24th. Okay, so that surveillance camera of Kelsey Barrett at the Safeway, that's the last time Kelsey's ever seen in public. And Patrick Frazee tells the police that he picked up their daughter and left, and that's the last time that he saw her. But what was strange is he never reported her missing. Nobody actually reported her missing until about 10 days later when her mother finally called and asked the police to do a welfare check on her. Now remember, her mother doesn't live in Colorado because Kelsey moved there to be closer to Patrick. So her mother's not hearing from her, she's not answering calls, she's not answering texts, nothing's happening, she's worried about her daughter, so she calls the local Colorado police and asks them to do a, a welfare check, and when they go in, they don't see anything awry, they, nothing's missing, it doesn't appear that there's been a struggle, everything seems fine. So at first, they say she's a missing person, but if anybody has information about her, let us know, but at this point, we're, we're not saying foul play happened, there's no sign that foul play happened, we're just saying she's a missing person, so keep an eye out for her. Now remember, Kelsey was a flight instructor she worked for a company called Doff Aviation, and they actually received a text from her. So her employer received a text saying that she was going to be taking a week off from work and she needed some time. And some of her coworkers weren't really surprised by that. They'd seen that Kelsey had been stressed out lately. They'd known that she'd just gotten into a big fight with her fiance, Patrick Frazee. So they figured she just needed a little time and nobody really questioned it. She also allegedly sent a text to Patrick Frazee, but that text was sent from over 600 miles away. Now remember, her phone was with Patrick Frazee's phone from the 22nd to the 24th, but on November 25th, her cell phone pinged off a tower 700 miles away in Idaho. And it was strange that her mother was the one to call and report her missing, even though her mother lived in a different state. But Patrick, who lived in that state with her, who was engaged to her and who had a child with her, didn't report her missing. Now, as you know, we talk about this on my channel all the time, how when somebody goes missing or somebody turns up dead, the first person that they're usually gonna look at is somebody close to them, a significant other, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a husband, etc. And so Patrick Frazee would have been that person, but at first it seemed like the police didn't really think he was that person. They didn't search his house. They said he was being cooperative. They didn't search his house or his property, all 35 acres of it. They claimed that there was no records of any issues between the two, no records of domestic violence that they knew of, but when they're asked, like, do you plan on searching Patrick's house or his property? They said, you know, we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to look into that. So they were being very tight-lipped and this made a lot of people suspicious. The police were shut down about this. They weren't releasing anything. They kept giving really vague answers, kind of like Patrick Frazee's lawyer, who always answered things with, I can't answer that or I don't know or I can't tell you that. That seemed to be <laughs> Patrick Frazee's lawyer's go-to response. But the police were pretty much saying the same thing. They weren't saying anything at all and this led people to start speculating, especially when news cameras captured the FBI going to Patrick Frazee's mother's ranch and cutting the lock on the gate and entering the property. So they have this the search warrant to go on the property and it's weeks after Kelsey's gone missing and law enforcement won't say why it's taken so long to search Patrick Frazee's property or what triggered them to do it at that point when they hadn't at all in the past couple of weeks. And they didn't have any answers for anybody. They just said they couldn't give details because the warrant had been sealed. Then news cameras picked up, you know, these, these big digger machines. <laughs> what are they called, digger machines? Oh my God, I don't know what they're called. But the, the media picks up these big machines with shovels on them that, that dig up large amounts of earth. And they capture these machines and these trucks going onto the property and digging on the property, an excursion which took days. 
They also took his red pickup truck and there was some confusion about this pickup truck. Was it Patrick's? Was it Kelsey's? Patrick had possession of it at that point, but it was the vehicle that Kelsey usually drove and I still don't have much clarification on that. So if you guys know, let, let me know. But even though they're cutting the gate on his property, even though they're digging around on his property and they took his truck, law enforcement still won't come right out and say that he's a suspect and they leave his daughter in his care while all this is happening. Which I, I kind of had a problem with that because especially so soon after the Chris Watts thing and this just gives me Josh Powell vibes. If you suspect a man or a woman of, you know, disposing of their significant other, it's probably a good idea to just place the baby with somebody else while you figure that out, in my opinion. And why didn't Patrick report his fiance missing for 10 days when his lawyers asked, you know, what was he doing in those 10 days? The lawyer's like, he was working and taking care of his baby. But there's no reason or answer to why Kelsey could have just disappeared and Patrick wouldn't have called anybody, not even her mother. So on December 18th, 2018, this is almost a full month after Kelsey has gone missing, they return to the Frazee property. So they said this was a routine follow-up, right? That's why they were at the Frazee residence, but they brought like five cars. It was a convoy of cars and vans of law enforcement and somebody actually got this on camera. So what kind of routine follow-up dictates that you bring five like law enforcement vehicles to this property. No arrests were made at this time, but Patrick Frazee was arrested soon after. And on December 21st, the police finally made an announcement that they believed Kelsey Barrett was no longer alive. He's charged with first degree murder and he's also charged with solicitation to commit murder. So this obviously once again made people question what the heck was going on. They wanted to know, did he try to pay somebody to kill his fiance? Did he attempt to do it himself? What's going on? But still the police are very tight lipped about this. And after he's arrested, we have all these people coming forward that knew him and knew Kelsey and, and they said much of the same thing, which was, he just seemed like a normal small town guy. He seemed fine. We can't believe that this is happening. And this reminded me so much of the Chris Watts case because that's pretty much what people said after we found out what Chris did. People who knew him were like, he was such a nice guy, he'd help you out. He just seemed normal. And that's scary. I think that's the scariest part about these cases is you just cannot pinpoint who it's gonna happen to, and who's going to be responsible for it. But at this point, we don't have a body. They haven't found Kelsey. So how did the police actually end up making the decision to arrest Patrick? And we'll soon find out that they used a mixture of technology, specifically cell phone records, and also they used the testimony of somebody who, who knew exactly what Patrick Frazee was doing. And that's where Crystal Lee Kenny comes into the picture. So Crystal Kenny was a 32-year-old nurse from Idaho, and it appeared that Patrick and Crystal had known each other for some time. They used to go to rodeos, and they kind of knew each other from the rodeo scene, and, you know, they'd, they'd had a relationship on and off, and they were seeing each other and carrying on this relationship as he was engaged to Kelsey. So Crystal becomes entwined in this situation now and she tells police that Patrick told her Kelsey was abusive, a drug addict, an alcoholic, abusive to their child, distant from their child, and that he was pretty much raising the baby by himself. Patrick told Crystal that he wanted Kelsey gone and he kind of colluded with Crystal on how they were going to kill Kelsey. And plan A was that they were gonna poison her favorite coffee drink. And this is some really devious planning here because what Patrick wants Crystal to do is befriend Kelsey, get close to her, become, you know, a part of her life, and then go to Starbucks, get her favorite coffee, put poison in it or medicine that Crystal has being a nurse, and then go to Kelsey's house and give her the coffee, which she will then drink and, and die. And Crystal does this to the point where she actually shows up at Kelsey's house with the coffee, but she can't go through with it. She can't put the poison in it. So plan B is now Patrick wants Crystal to hide and wait outside of Kelsey's house. And when she comes out, just hit her over the head with a bat and kill her that way. So Crystal actually does go to Kelsey 
Kelsey's house and lays in wait outside of her townhouse, but Kelsey's not home at this point, so she waits for a little while, and then she gets in her car and she leaves and heads toward Patrick Frazee's ranch. But as she's driving away from Kelsey's house, Kelsey is driving by her on her way home. And Crystal said, you know, I could have turned around and I could have done it, but I, I just couldn't go through with it. It's almost as if she feels that she saved Kelsey's life, which I have a very different feeling about this, but we'll get to that. And this wasn't just a story that Crystal was coming up with in order to explain her connection to Patrick and Kelsey to the police. She'd actually told two friends prior to the death of Kelsey that Patrick Frazee had requested her help in killing his fiance. In fact, Patrick had asked Crystal at least three times between September 1st and November 22nd to help him kill Kelsey. And Crystal told two of her friends this. So she told one of her friends, a co-worker, on October 22nd that Frazee had asked for help in killing his fiance. And she told another friend, a paralegal friend of hers, that you know he had continued asking her for help. And this paralegal friend of hers had suggested she go to the police and say something. But obviously, at that point, Crystal had not. So once again, this is before, before Kelsey is killed or gone missing. This isn't a situation where we have one murderer, right? This isn't a situation where we have one person who knows what happened to Kelsey. This is a situation where we have multiple people who are aware that there's a man out there who wants to kill his girlfriend or his fiance. Multiple people. And yet nobody says anything. Nobody does anything. And if they had, most likely they could have saved Kelsey's life. Okay, so now that kind of does bring us to the trial and new things that are coming out and pretty much Crystal Kenny's whole claim of what happened the day that Kelsey Barrett died. So Crystal claimed that after he asked her a couple of times to kill Kelsey and she couldn't do it or didn't do it, he just decided he was going to do it himself. But he texted her on Thanksgiving and said, you have a mess to clean up, get here now. And at that point, what she did was she gathered the supplies that she would need to essentially clean up a crime scene. She had a full hazmat suit. She had those little blue booties that the CSI teams use, several pairs of gloves, and she got a bunch of bleach. And she went to Colorado. She picked up Kelsey's key from Patrick Frazee at his ranch, and then she drove to Kelsey's townhouse, let herself in, and said she walked into an absolute uh, crime scene. Essentially, yes, yes, Crystal, somebody was murdered there, so it's going to be a little bit of a mess. She said there was blood splattered all over the walls, all over the floors, couches, drapes, toys, everything. So she went through and she systematically cleaned this up and things that she couldn't get clean, like pillows or the, the drapes, toys, things like that. She just threw them away in these big garbage bags and it took her four hours to do this. So like I said, when they initially went into Kelsey's house, they found no signs of foul play. And I'm not sure if they really thoroughly checked for blood or if they, they brought a forensics team in or if they just kind of looked around and saw that things seemed to be clean and undisturbed. I'm kind of curious why they didn't smell all this bleach, but regardless, they said everything was fine. But after they're talking to Crystal, they go back in and they find spots of blood and they find these like streak marks as if somebody was trying to clean up the blood. And Crystal claims, because she's a saint, guys, she's she's a saint. She doesn't drive back and beat Kelsey in the head with a pipe when she sees her driving home. And she left little spots of blood there purposely for the police to find. So she's actually like the good guy here. So this girl, this nurse, by the way, a nurse, oh, and she's also a mother of two who lives with her ex-husband and her two children still. For some reason, her and her ex-husband still live together. I'm sure they have some arrangement. But she she lives with her ex-husband. She has two kids and she's a nurse. And this woman who's a mother and a nurse, you know, somebody who's supposed to take care of people, she, she actually continues to have a relationship with Patrick Frazee after being asked for a month to to have her help him kill his his fiance. She continues to be with this man and she claims he was abusive and controlling and violent so she was scared for her life. She was scared what would happen to her if she didn't go along with what he wanted. And of course, there's a lot of support for this. Another ex of Patrick Frazee's came out and said that he was controlling and he was abusive. He actually got into trouble at the hospital when his daughter was born because she was born three weeks early and the doctors wanted her to 
be in the nursery to have extra care, not in the room with Kelsey and Patrick. And Patrick lost his mind and he was very verbally abusive to the nursing staff. And they actually had to call CPS in and the baby was removed from their care while they did an investigation to see if Patrick was abusive to Kelsey because the nurses thought that the way he was acting, he might have been. And there doesn't seem to be any follow-up on that, by the way, which is strange. But so there, there's some um, there's some point of reference here to suggest that Patrick may have been a controlling, abusive, scary kind of guy, but at the same time, you live 700 miles away in Idaho. So what are you scared of? If you tell the police and you live 700 miles away, what are you really, uh, what are you afraid of of happening? I guess that's my question. What was she concerned that he was going to do? Go after her and kill her? After she told the police that he was trying to kill his fiance, is he going to now kill her? Which is going to clearly look like an act of retribution to the police. So it just seemed strange to me why she felt comfortable telling her friends, but not going to anybody who actually would be able to do something or save the life of a young mother with a small baby. According to Crystal, when she gave her testimony during Patrick Frazee's trial, Patrick was very descriptive to her about how he killed Kelsey. He said that he blindfolded her and he, he had her smell scented candles. And while she was smelling the candles, he beat her to death. And while this was happening, their daughter was in the next room. And Patrick allegedly told Crystal that Kelsey's last words were, please stop. So Crystal cleans up Kelsey's townhouse. She actually finds an entire tooth, which she thinks must have fallen from Kelsey's mouth as she was being beat to death by her fiance. And she throws, she throws the tooth away. And then afterwards, Patrick Frazee tells her, well, you're in this now, you know, you're involved. So regardless of what happens, you know, you're going to be involved and you're going to get in trouble because you helped me. So she claims that Patrick put Kelsey's body into this black tote and, you know, they, they kind of like hid it for a while, I believe, on this hay bale. And then after that, he put the tote in a fire and he burned the tote with the body in it. And then he gave Crystal Kelsey's phone and said, you know, drive it to Idaho and, and get rid of it, which she then did. In fact, I believe that he initially had wanted Crystal to drive Kelsey's body back to Idaho and dispose of it there, but she said no, that that was going too far. That, that was going too far. You spent four hours in a hazmat suit cleaning up a crime scene where you found an entire tooth on the floor, but no, can't drive the body to Idaho. That's going too far. And what's really sad to me and what reminds me so much of the, the Chris and Shanann Watts case is you could see in the text that um, Kelsey was sending Patrick in the six months leading up to her death that she was really sensing he was pulling away and she was also trying to save their relationship. She would text him constantly, you know, she was always the one to initiate the texts and he would just text her back like kind of uninterested, um, you know, distant and she would say, you know, I love you, things are rough right now, I understand that things aren't great but I do love you and she would want those words of love in return but he wouldn't give them and she was sending him listings of houses, you know, she wanted to live with him, they were getting married, they had a child together and they lived in separate homes. She wanted to live together, get married, raise their daughter together. And she was sending him listing upon listing of potential houses they could buy. And he just wasn't, he wasn't going for it. We also have a witness who was a customer of Patrick Frazee's. Now, apparently this lady was a customer of his. He had a, a horse shoeing business. And so he'd go to people's houses and, you know, put the shoes on their horses or take them off. I'm not sure, but he did something with the shoes and the horses. And you know, while he was there, and this was after Kelsey had disappeared, this woman was talking to him and they were going over what could have happened to her. And she said, you know, hopefully she comes back soon. She could come back. And Patrick said, oh, she's not coming back. And even before that, before Kelsey went missing, Patrick had told this woman, you know, I just want to raise my daughter with somebody other than my fiance. Like, I just want her gone. So this was posted 21 hours ago and it says, CBI agent says he doesn't know where investigation would be without Kenny's testimony. And this is Crystal Kenny. 
It says a lead agent in the Patrick Frazee murder case testified on Thursday morning that he doesn't know where the investigation would be without the testimony of Frazee's ex-girlfriend, Crystal Lee Kenny, who was accused of helping Frazee murder Barrett, but took a plea deal on a tampering charge. So essentially, she's not getting like... Um, you know, an accomplice to murder. She's not getting any any crazy charges, just evidence tampering, which in my opinion, it goes way beyond evidence tampering. She knew that Patrick was going to kill this woman for months before it happened. And not only that, but she did so much more than tamper with evidence. She removed the evidence. She completely got rid of the evidence that would essentially be putting Patrick Frazee behind bars without a question. And at this point, because there's no body and there's not a lot of like physical evidence to tie him to Kelsey's murder or disappearance, there's a chance he might not get convicted. Frazee's lead attorney, Adam Steigerwald, pushed back on Kenny's testimony, pointing out that she only provided information to investigators after the plea deal was signed. That's pretty common. Also on Thursday, the jury heard more testimony about the DNA evidence discovered inside Barrett's townhome. Steigerwald pointed out that evidence of Frazee's DNA was hardly found among the samples tested. Now, allegedly, Patrick Frazee told this woman named Mary Longmire, who's a Department of Human Services employee, that his relationship with Kelsey wasn't doing very well and that he'd received a text from her on Sunday morning, November 24th, two days after she disappeared, asking, do you even love me? And he said that he tried to respond, of course I do, but that his text didn't go through. Longmire testified, Frazee said he did not hear from Barrett again. So they're saying that Crystal's testimony obviously is imperative to putting Patrick behind bars. And I mean, at this point, I agree, since all the evidence was cleaned up by somebody. Who, who was it cleaned up? Oh, the same person whose testimony is imperative because literally her word now is pretty much all they have. Now, they did find traces of blood in the townhouse and that blood did match Kelsey Barrett's DNA, but at the same time, like his lawyer said, there's not a lot of physical evidence saying that Patrick Frazee was there. So his attorney could make the argument that anybody could have killed Kelsey. Anybody could have taken Kelsey. In fact, Crystal herself could have been responsible for killing Kelsey and she might have had a motive, like trying to get the other woman out of the way so that she could be with Patrick full time. And now I'm gonna talk about the tooth and not the tooth that <laughs> Crystal found in Kelsey's apartment or townhouse while she was cleaning it, the one she threw away, but another tooth. So they found this tooth in a burn pile on Frazee's property and they wanted to know obviously if the tooth belonged to Kelsey because that would kind of show and corroborate Crystal's story that after Patrick had killed Kelsey, he'd put her in this, you know, big tote and then burned the tote. So it said that investigators state other testing found it was likely human and belonged to a female, but the FBI wasn't able to link the tooth found to Kelsey Barrett. The testing ultimately destroyed the tooth and a forensic anthropologist who testified today said she'd examined the fragment of the tooth and she revealed it was actually two fragments. One was pretty small and the other was bigger. She told the court after examining it that it was a human tooth. She testified that she's tested hundreds of things similar to a tooth, so she knew what to look for and what to compare it to. Later on that day, a DNA analyst with the CBI, Caitlin Rogers, said she initially tried to test the tooth. She told the court she tried to test the tooth and all she could gather from the fragment was it was a human tooth that belonged to a female. She said DNA was detected on the tooth, but there wasn't enough for them to develop a profile from it. The tooth was then sent to the FBI for further testing. Their testing ultimately destroyed the tooth because of the specific testing they performed. According to Rogers, the FBI couldn't retrieve any DNA from it either. Caitlin Rogers also told the court she tested about 92 pieces of evidence in the case. Some of the standout evidence included blood from floorboards in Kelsey Barrett's condo, blood from the fireplace, and blood from a baby gate. Rogers said the blood from the fireplace was only one person's blood, Kelsey's. She said the same about the baby gate. She testified she tested both items which came back positive for blood, and when she tested them, she said the blood came back to a single single contributor, which was Kelsey Barrett. When she moved on to the floorboards, she said Barrett's DNA was present, but so was someone else's. Rogers stated that Susan Gorney's DNA was present on the floorboard, and we learned today that she lived in the townhome before Kelsey for more than 20 years, so it was not uncommon for her DNA to be found places in the townhouse. 
Earlier in the trial, Crystal Lee told investigators she cleaned the crime scene at Barrett's condo where she was allegedly killed. Lee told the court she used bleach to clean up the condo. Prosecutors asked the DNA analyst what effect bleach could have on DNA. Rogers said bleach completely destroys DNA. So places such as between the floorboards wouldn't be affected because the bleach didn't reach between them. Lee told investigators she purposely left spots of blood so investigators would find them, specifically blood on the fireplace. She's a hero. Crystal, Crystal Lee Kenny is a hero. So pretty much what we found out is Patrick allegedly killed Kelsey. Crystal helped him clean it up, cover it up, get rid of the body. She also was responsible for sending those texts to Kelsey's employer and to Patrick allegedly. So this, this was a whole plan of how can we make it seem as if Kelsey's just left and not dead and that they used her phone in order to try to throw people off the trail. So an agent on the case, an agent Atkinson said she also went to Nash Ranch because that's where Patrick had allegedly stored Kelsey's body in that black tote on top of a hay bale. So she went on top of that hay bale and she found this stain on the hay. When investigators were processing the scene, they measured the stain and a picture of this was shown to the court. After the picture was shown, District Attorney Dan May handed the investigator a tape measure and a black box, a black tote box, that they had retrieved from Patrick Frazee's home. He asked Agent Atkinson to measure it. The measurements matched the same measurements of the stain on the hay bale, about three feet long and just shy of two feet wide. On top of that, a close friend of Patrick's took the stand as well, a man named Bob Slagle. He said that he and Patrick were good friends, and he told the court that after Kelsey went missing, he went with Patrick to different places of business to trace an alibi for the day that Kelsey went missing. Prosecutors also asked him about a specific envelope they found at Frazee's property. Slagle reviewed the envelope, which had handwritten notes on it. He told the court that was the alibi Frazee had come up with for Thanksgiving when Kelsey went missing. The jury had already heard previous testimony that law enforcement had found a package left by Kelsey's front door and when they went back the next day, that package was gone. Bob Slagle testified that he was the one to pick up the package and he was seen on a neighbor's surveillance camera doing so. Additionally, a police officer from the Twin Falls Police Department in Idaho testified about evidence he found at the home Crystal Lee shared with her ex-husband. Officer Hayes of the Twin Falls Police Department says that the CBI agent asked him to look for a burn pile that could contain a purse, documents, and a possible cell phone. The officer stated when he went to search the property, he found two burn piles. In one pile located in the backyard of the Lee property, the officer said he uncovered what he called a piece of electronic equipment similar to that used in a phone. He also said they found a tempered glass screen protector that had looked to have been burned. Hayes said as they continued to search the property, they discovered another burn pile on the northeast side of the property, and it was revealed officers found more pieces of what they believed to be a cell phone. Crystal Lee had testified earlier that she burned Kelsey Barrett's phone along with one of her own phones on her property. So, I mean, this is pretty, like, straightforward at this point. And I'm just hoping that they don't they don't figure out a way to kind of twist this and, and get him off or get him, you know, acquitted. Because this trial is about to come to a close. It says, both sides expected to rest, present closing arguments Friday, which is today as I'm filming this. It says, on paper, Friday is expected to be a big day in the Patrick Frazee murder trial. The prosecution will likely rest their case. The defense will bring up their witnesses and both sides could present their closing arguments. Whether all three of those aspects of the trial are completed by the end of the day will depend on how quickly attorneys interview and cross-examine the remaining witnesses. So this trial could potentially be done and have a verdict by Monday. And, and that's kind of crazy because it's only been about, I feel like, 10 11 days at the most of this trial. And obviously you're gonna get a lot of information and a lot of evidence presented, but it just feels like it went so quickly, especially considering how much time it took to get here, to finally put him on trial. I have no doubt in my mind, personally, my opinion, that Patrick Frazee killed Kelsey Barrett. He told many people that he didn't want her around anymore. He told people he didn't want to raise his daughter with Kelsey. He <laughs> told his girlfriend that he wanted her dead. His girlfriend told people that he wanted her dead. So it's just a very, um, 
obvious kind of case to me. But of course, when you're putting somebody in prison for life, he's not going to get the death penalty. They decided against that. So when you're putting somebody in prison for the rest of their life, the jury is going to deliberate as they should. That's their responsibility to get all the facts and make a decision based on facts, not emotion. There was a point where people were even saying that Patrick Creasy's mother was involved. And, you know, I'm not saying whether she was or, or not, obviously, I don't know, but he did call her that Thanksgiving day and he did spend Thanksgiving evening with her. They had dinner together. There were also some allegations that she'd made a post on Facebook and put a picture about 4.23 in the afternoon, which would have been right around the time that Patrick was getting to her house after killing Kelsey. She posted on Facebook, yay, the witch is dead after posting a picture of Glenda the Good Witch. And allegedly, ABC reported that that wasn't the correct Sheila Frazy, that it was a different Sheila Frazy who happened to write that on Facebook on the very day that Kelsey died, at the very time when Patrick would have been, you know, showing up at her house or his house because they lived there together. It's strange for sure. It could have been like a prank, I guess, but at the same time, at that day, nobody would have known what happened. What happened to Kelsey? Nobody would have known that she was dead, so there would be no reason to, like, you know, try to set anybody up or try to play a stupid prank. So it's definitely strange. And I have a picture, a screenshot of that alleged um, Facebook post. So I'm just saying I don't know how accurate it is or, or where it really came from, but apparently the police did know about it. They got a tip about it, and that that is the reason why they ended up questioning her and removing her from the house as well, allegedly. So we shall see what happens. I will do a quick update once the decision comes in, but hopefully he's convicted. I do believe that, that he did this. I mean, there's really no other option. I mean, unless Crystal did it herself, but I find that hard to believe. They definitely work together, and I definitely don't think that Crystal is as much of a hero as she thinks she is. I don't think that Crystal is as much of a good person as she thinks she is, and I think that they could have gotten her for way more than evidence tempering. I think she still would have made the deal and cooperated if they'd given her a little bit more of a harsh charge, like conspiracy to commit murder, because technically, you know, that's what it was. And I really want to look into this camera, and if any of these, these people, these women, that Crystal confessed to, saying that her boyfriend or whatever the hell he was, her lover, whatever the hell he was, was interested in killing his fiance and had asked her to help him. If any of these women who Crystal told that to are watching, I just want to look at the camera and ask you, what the hell were you thinking? Especially the paralegal especially the paralegal, because that's like, you know the law. And it's not as if these women didn't take her seriously. It's not as if these women were like, oh, he's just, you know, exaggerating. They knew that it was serious. Any kind of like, I want to kill my wife or I want to kill my fiance, will you help me kind of stuff there, that's not somebody joking around. That's not somebody just like joshing you. That's real intent there. And <laughs> any one of these women, Crystal, her two friends that she told, they could have at any point come forward and, you know, Kelsey may still be here today, able to raise her daughter and, you know, live her life. It's ridiculous the extent that people will go to to convince themselves they're not involved or this isn't their business. And it's ridiculous the extent that people will go to to separate themselves from a situation that makes them uncomfortable or they don't want to get involved in, even if it means that somebody else dies. Let me know what you guys think about this case and the trial. If you've been following it, let me know what you think about it. Let me know what you think about um, superhero Batman, <laughs> Crystal Kenny, who so many times could have killed Kelsey, but didn't. Yet, instead of turning Kelsey's cell phone over to the police or calling the police afterwards, she burned the cell phone and kept it to herself until she was discovered. But, you know, whatever. She's still a hero. Not all heroes wear capes. Some wear rodeo hats. Thank you guys so much for being here. Remember to check the link in the description box if you want to give Magellan TV a try. I highly suggest it. 
Once again, I am working on a multi-parter. Uh, we're doing a cults series this, this month. It's a cult series this month, yeah. We're doing a cult series, it's gonna be at least three parts, I believe, two to three parts. But I am working on it and I have been researching a lot and that's why I've kind of been MIA and I haven't really even been on social media and I haven't been posting a lot of videos because I've been like diving into that. I wasn't really aware of what I was biting off when I when I jumped into this case but what I wanted to do is not release them like weeks apart I wanted to release each part a couple of days apart so that takes a lot of planning and a lot of pre-recording and a lot of editing so that you guys don't have to wait a very long time between each part which is why I haven't posted anything yet because I think in the past when I've done cults I would do like one each week now with this I don't want you guys to wait a long time between videos so that's why I kind of wanted to get all the research done all my notes done and kind of just record in one foul sweep and then kind of split it up but we'll see we'll see what happens regardless you're gonna have all the videos closer together than usual <laughs> thank you so much for being here stay kind and stay beautiful and I will see you soon bye